thanks everybody for coming. Um, I actually didn't prepare a formal speech because I hate those. And I feel like the Q&A and the conversation is a whole lot more interesting anyway. But maybe just to set the stage, I'll give a little bit of background on how I fell down the rabbit hole, so to speak, and haven't gotten out yet, clearly. Uh, so the first thing I usually say when I'm talking to people about this subject is that I am a national security reporter. I'm not a UFOologist. Uh, I spent most of my journalism career covering the Pentagon, the military, to some extent, the intelligence agencies, um, the war on terror. I spent a good bit of time overseas covering the war in Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, and in 2017 is when I sort of got interested and um, focused a little bit on the issue of UFOs. And as was mentioned, it, it all started with some sources that had reached out and um, a couple that I had known for a number of years, um, you know, who were talking about, hey, you know, there's a Pentagon research effort on UFOs and pretty soon uh, it's gonna be out in the open. And the, the pretty soon it's going to come out in the open was because one of the, the key government officials who was in charge of that portfolio, you guys are all probably familiar with Louis Elizondo, was getting ready to leave the government and go public. Because the way he describes it, he was very frustrated that this very small, little, tiny, puny office in the Pentagon, um, known as ATIP, the Advanced Aerial Threat Identification Program, uh, wasn't being taken seriously. And he was finding there was all this information, but nobody above him wanted, you know, anything to do with it. And so that's how it all began. So I was one of the first reporters to write about the existence of this office. Politico was interested in it for a number of reasons, but one of them was because it, it was uh, fathered, so to speak, by Senator Harry Reid of Nevada, who was interested in the subject wanted more government research to be done and secured the 20 some million dollars that got this program going. And so there was a political angle to it for us because we, we cover politics and policy. And obviously there was a military Pentagon angle. So that's how I got into it. And over the last couple of years or since then, I've covered some other aspects as the story has kind of expanded. Um, and that included Members of Congress were, were interested in learning more, so there was a series of classified briefings. The Navy issued a series of new regulations for pilots and personnel to report sightings, which was seen by a lot of people in the military world, in the national security community, as a big deal. That, you know, publicly we're now saying, if you guys see something you can't understand, don't be afraid to report it. Because as you all know, there's a stigma, more than a stigma, a stigma associated with this subject. And so I, I, I was one of the reporters who, who covered, covered that. Um, and then just to bring us current, uh, government was uh, required or requested in an in a intelligence bill last year by the Congress to, to write this public report, which came out at the end of June of this year, which, you know, as you all know or have read, was kind of a nothing burger. It didn't say very much. It was kind of what, what we knew, but it, it was significant, I guess, in the sense that it was the government, you know, in one place in a public document, or at least the unclassified version of what is a longer document that we haven't seen, was saying, yes, there's all these reports. Many of them are credible. Many of them, we don't know what they are. They're exhibiting all kinds of aerodynamic properties that we can't explain. And oh, by the way, which I thought was the most significant part of that report, they're not ours. So the government on the record, you can believe it, you cannot believe it, and we can get into all of that. Um, but I'll, I'll kind of wrap it up by just saying that what I've been trying to focus on is, I keep saying this, but the, the paper trail. So what is the government doing? What are they saying? And more, more importantly than what they're saying, what are they doing? Who's doing it? What kind of public money is being spent on it? Uh, where's that money going? So, you know, if they're commissioning studies, 
who's getting paid to do these studies? You know, who are those people? What is their background? What are their credentials? Um, I've also been around long enough to know that whatever the government is saying, obviously, is not the full story. I think that is especially true on this subject. And I think there's a couple reasons for that. One, I believe that the government does have, we were just talking about this, I was talking, John was saying this outside. When you say the government, you gotta define what you're talking about, because there are different governments in some ways. There's the public facing the politicians, even the, you know, the heads of executive branch agencies um, that obviously are saying some things publicly. But then there's obviously a very secretive, compartmentalized world of the government that I'm convinced a lot of the people at the top that are the public facing government, they don't even know about. They're not read in. So when you say the CIA is lying, well, maybe, but I think it could also be because the head of the CIA has no idea what he's talking about. Because the netherworld of those agencies doesn't necessarily share everything up the top. And so I do believe there are pieces of information on this subject that the government has in its custody that it's not shared with us. Do I believe they have all the answers? I don't. I don't think that there's some big reveal somewhere that they're just sitting on. And the reason why I believe that is not because I trust the government, it's because I know human nature. I, I just don't think something like that could be kept secret forever, unless you have such a vast conspiracy, spin machine, propaganda complex to so jumble the story that it's hidden that way. And I don't give them enough credit for that. I just don't think they're that good. I really don't. Um, and the last thing I'll say about the government or the government within the government is that's one of the things that really interests me the most in this subject. If there is a government within a government, that's a great story because it doesn't have oversight. The committee chairman on the intelligence committees or others clearly aren't read in on what they're doing. So there is no public oversight. They can effectively do things on their own without any um, democratic authority over them. And that to me is the biggest story here. If there's a bunch of things going on and they haven't told us, or you know, there's a bunch of secret UFO uh, flying saucers that we've reverse engineered and we just haven't told the public about it, that's an amazing story. Um, but then at the same time, you have to account for the national security bureaucracy, which is by definition designed to keep secrets. And it's not because they necessarily want to keep the secrets from the public. They don't want China, Russia, potential enemies, number one, to know what we know, but also to know what we don't. In other words, there's stuff out there and we can't figure out what the hell it is. We don't want them to know that either because we don't really know what they know. We might know some of what they know, but we know a little bit. Um, so there's all these reasons why I think there's more data, there's more information, there's more of a story in government files that, that we don't know. But again, I, I always come back to this. I don't think it's because they have the answers and they just want to hide them. I think in some ways it's because they don't have the answers and they don't want the rest of the world to know that. Um, but I also think, and I, I promise I'll stop here, I said I wasn't going to give a speech. Um, uh, I also believe the stigma associated with this issue is, has been so great that I think the stigma has existed in the government in a very real way for a very long time. In other words, you can uh, believe there are secret compartments of different agencies that might have data. And by the way, I think when I say agencies, I also mean defense contractors. Because if you have Lockheed Martin Skunk Works building a secret spy plane that's you know, completely under wraps, not known by the public, you might want the UFO secrets to be with them because they can't be sought under the Freedom of Information Act. So by law, you know, and obviously there are exceptions, the government has to cough up stuff. If you figure out they got stuff, and you want to ask for it under the law, 
They have to at least respond to your request. But Lockheed doesn't have to respond. So if you trust that the C, and I, I'm not picking on Lockheed Martin, but if you trust that, you know, somebody once told me that TRW had all the UFO secrets. TRW doesn't exist anymore. They were bought by Raytheon, maybe. You know, they were gobbled up by another defense company. So if TRW had all the secrets, it's really hard to get it back. And, and that would actually be a smart place to put it. Um, but you can agree that that is a reality. And also, I think, believe that the government has never had a comprehensive agency-wide effort to actually find out what all these things are. And I think a lot of it is a stigma. I talked to uh, so many people in the government or former very senior level people with very high clearances who said nobody wanted to touch this issue. Nobody wanted it because it was the tinfoil hat wearing crowd that talked about UFOs. So I also think that, that, that you know, these, this push that's been going on to get the government to be more comprehensive about gathering information, compiling it in one place, I think is also an attempt to get it out of the little deep dark corners that it might still exist. Um, and that's the other thing, uh, reinventing the wheel. Nobody does that better than the government. And the reason why is the people who know things retire and die. And they don't always pass it along to the next person. They don't always keep the documents. They don't always keep the records. And so I also think there's such a long history of the government and UFOs. Um, I think in some ways you can throw it all out because I don't know that they still have the information that they might have gathered in the 50s or the 60s or the 70s because it's just, it didn't survive. Um, because these agencies, especially the secret ones, they're not very good at chain of custody. We have this, we're passing it along to the next person coming up the line who's gonna have this portfolio. And so I think a lot of, the government's lost tons of information probably. And it's and that's different than burying it. I think it's also because they're just the government. I mean, on the one hand, we, we criticize the government for not having their shit together ever. But then somehow on the UFO issue, everything is in line, everything works, everything is passed along, everything is secret. They, you know, the Hollywood version. So like, which is it? I think it's the former, it's not the latter. So with that, I'm gonna shut up and let you guys ask me questions. But I promise to try and answer. <laughs> okay, I no one else. So when the December 2017 articles came out, yours and New York Times, the public, you know, it was big with the public, it was big with media all over the place, but we didn't know how politicians were gonna react. Uh, the first indication I think we got was you when you did your uh, interview with the Space Council, some of the members and some of the uh, politicians involved with, uh, you know, NASA and space policy. And they were surprisingly very open. I was surprised. Were you surprised? And then since then, you know, so many politicians seem to be open to the topic. Was that surprising to you? It was a little surprising, but I guess... I didn't have real like expectations, I guess, because as I said before, like I, you know, in the 20 years that I covered, you know, the military or national security, I think UFOs came up like maybe once or twice in 20 years. I, I do remember there was a big event at the National Press Club in Washington. I spent most of my years living in Washington, um, and I remember like, oh, aha, there's a bunch of Air Force guys going up there to talk about UFOs. That's cool, but like nobody covered it, like. It was just like, you know, they rented a room at the press club and they're going to tell their story. And so I didn't have a ton of expectations. I guess I did think um, that uh, the politicians would be, you know, resistant to talk about it. And so, but I think you're right, it became very clear. And maybe it's a generational thing where, like, you have some younger people, more open minded people, just in general. You know, this isn't the 50s and the 60s anymore. And so I do remember Politico was doing an event. We were doing a space event. Because um, one of the things I cover a lot of these days is space policy and, and sort of the new space race, um, not involving aliens, involving humans. Um, uh, we had done an event, and I was moderating a conversation. And we had a couple members of Congress who were on some relevant, sort of relevant oversight committees, science committee, I think. Um, and at the end of the panel discussion, this was pretty soon after the stories first came out, I was like, you know what, what the, what the hell, I'm going to ask them about UFOs. What do they think? 
I, of course, waited for the last question of the panel. And they, they were, one was a Democrat, one was a Republican, and they were very open about it. In fact, the Republican was like, I've told the chairman of the committee that we should hold hearings on this. And so um, I do think, uh, in a very real way, that the ball has moved. And by that, I mean the public discussion, um, this issue kind of being in a very real, legitimate way on the public agenda. Uh, is because of the Congress. It's because of the elected officials. It's not because of the Pentagon. The Pentagon didn't want to talk about this. In fact, you know, Lou Elizondo quit because he thought nobody wanted to hear about it. Um, and it was the Navy pilots, primarily, who were obviously younger. They're not old like us. They came forward and they were like, what the hell is this? So I, I do think, um, <clears throat> I do think that was uh, how much people were open to it, particularly the political figures, was a little, a little surprising. At least a little. And here in the front, and then we'll go to the. Um, what, what brought your interest up in this? Was there a personal event in your life that brought you into this? I mean, Just you know, curiosity? people ask me that. Um, I mean, when I first heard from, I first got wind of this from a, a former Pentagon official who I had known when he was in the government. He worked in sort of the intelligence world. He wasn't a good source in the sense that he didn't tell me a whole lot um, because he couldn't uh, you know, talk a lot about what he did to a reporter. But he, you know, he was sort of one of those sources of mine over the years who was kind of the gut check guy. Like, I'm hearing this, does that sound right? Or who should I talk to? And so I trusted him. Um, and I think it was just sort of, I don't even remember thinking that much about the UFO issue. It was more like, this is a good story. There's a guy who works in the Pentagon who's apparently been spending millions of dollars on UFOs, and he's fed up, and he's gonna go public, and maybe he'll do it with me. So I was thinking more of just the journalists, like, this is a good story. Um, but as far as like my own personal views of UFOs, when I was a kid, I looked exactly, apparently, and I'd seen pictures, pretty close, to the little kid in Close Encounters, Barry, the little blonde kid, and I was exactly that age, I was five. My mother would take me to the grocery store and people would comment that I looked like the kid. And of course I was five or six, so I didn't know what that meant, but as I got older, I was like, oh, that kid, okay, interesting, and I saw the movie, and. Of course, I loved it, and I thought it was really well done. What I loved about that movie, by the way, was that um, it wasn't so much about alien invasion as it was about consciousness and communication. And I think people sort of missed that in that movie, like because you know the final scene and the pilots that were abducted and all that. So, um, I, you know, I didn't have a whole lot of preconceptions about the issue. I never had an experience. Um, I do remember as a kid being a little bit interested in like, I remember the Barney and Betty Hill story that fascinated me as like a middle schooler. I think I took a book out from the library about it or something. So like, yeah, I mean, I guess now that I'm, I'm I just remembered that actually. I guess there was a little bit of an interest in it, but like I said, 20 years covering the Pentagon, the military, the CIA, like it just it wasn't something you covered as a mainstream reporter. And part of it was the stigma. It's like, I don't want to video phone. It was like, you know, I, I have a friend who covered the Kennedy assassination for the Washington Post. And to this day, he claims they fired him because he wrote too many stories about, you know, the Kennedy conspiracy. I, I don't think that's true. But, um, but you yeah, know, this was a topic that you didn't really cover because, quite frankly, you were afraid that it would affect your professional standing. And, and you know, there wasn't a whole lot to, to cover. Like, people weren't talking about it. I, I was saying the other day that, you know, the last couple of years, you know, there's every day in DC, there's a million think tank events and discussions and policy debates. And, and you know, I used to go to those all the time for years and years. And I don't ever remember UFOs coming up. But now it's like every month, a couple times a month, the head of the Navy is up there or the head of, you know, some other agency and, and they're asked about it. It's like a couple summers ago, I went to this Aspen Security Forum in, in Colorado. And which is like, you know, I sort of hate those things because it's like the muckety-mucks of the national security bureaucracy and they all sort of pet each other for a week weekend and, and tell each other how smart they are and 
Um, and it's useful for a reporter who covers that world because you can pick up some PC stuff. But there was one of the events um, where a four-star admiral was doing a, I think he was talking about China. It was a completely different subject. And somebody just raised their hand and asked about UFOs. And I remember thinking like, this would never happen in Aspen because you don't bring this stuff up in this kind of audience. But I think it showed that it sort of busted, the issue is busted through a wall somehow. Gentlemen, who's right? question I have, you, you put it well, government reports are another report, but I think it's probably lots of us in the room expect quite a bit more out of it. I mean, this is a public classified party. Would you agree that most likely the only reason that the classified party is protect sources and methods and technology? I think so. I mean, um, I've talked to a few people who've seen it. I mean, they don't, they haven't shared a whole lot about it, but but I do think, and even the public report sort of, the public summary kind of alludes to it. But I do think what's in the classified report is number one, I think more detail on those 139 sightings that they apparently looked at. So I do think there's more detail on those including what you're alluding to, which is how they know it. So what onboard system on the Princeton picked it up? And what other sensor, as the military would call it, whether it was an airborne radar or whether it was gun camera uh, video footage. So you know that gets into sources and methods. This is how we gather intelligence. And they don't want you know other countries to know that, how we do it. So that's a pretty common thing that I think really has nothing to do with UFOs. It's just the way they operate. Um, I also think there's, there could potentially be stuff in there about who's doing what. In other words, like we know about ATIP, but I've been saying from the beginning, well, not from the beginning, but as I started to dig into this, a ATIP is like the distraction. That's a $25 million program in the Pentagon that had like literally one or two people dedicated to it. They did have some, like, the contractor, you know, Bigelow Aerospace did a bunch of studies, they commissioned a bunch of studies. But it was a really small operation. I mean, $25 million in the Pentagon is like the coins in the couch cushion. It's nothing. Um, and so uh, I, I have a pretty good sense that the public version of that report was kind of the takeaway. I mean, I think there's probably some interesting stuff in the other version, but if there was some something really dramatic in there, I think it would leak out. I, I mean, I, 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 you know, I, I, I think it's kind of a boring recounting of this chapter and verse of, like I said, a bunch of cases and other sort of information that they relied on to come to their conclusions, which you know they always want to keep that stuff secret. And you alluded to the intelligence point. It's really hard. To Anything of no secret. And it's not because of the scientists or anything. There's always got to be guards. And you right. can't keep that secret. So you that you pretty much you have I think it's know. it's not impossible. I mean, as you probably know, I, and I do think it's easier if it's like a classified aircraft program. So some factory somewhere is building, as we know, you know, throughout history they've done the F-117 stealth fighter, or the SR-71 Blackbird. I mean, those things were in development for years and years before we knew anything about it. So, I mean, there are ways, but, you know, that's that's a very sort of finite, dedicated program that you're keeping in secret. This is an issue that's everywhere. I mean, you can't, you wouldn't be able to keep it secret if, you know, uh, they knew that there were X amount of alien contacts or invasions or whatever you want to call it. Um, I just think it would be very very difficult, not impossible. Um, like I said, the only thing that I think that could explain it would be, and I'm not saying I believe that this is the case, but I know a lot of people have done a lot of research on this, but um, the extent to which the government bait and switch on this issue really has been comprehensive and planned and well coordinated. because. You know, you, you could layer on top of this over years and years and years a whole nother historical narrative, potentially, that blinds you, the public, to sort of what's really going on. 
And, and again, I, I come back to 20 years of knowing these people. I just don't give them that much credit. I don't think they're that good. I mean, you were on the inside. I mean, they're they're not. They're not. Um, we have this again. We have this. We, the government sucks, but we have a Hollywood version that they're you know they're doing all this secret stuff and everything is like coordinated. Like it can't be both. It really can't be both. What is right now the state going forward of the government and any investigations that they're going to continue with? Good question. Um, so I do think that, you know, uh, the story obviously is not done. Um, and I think a couple things. One, you know, the government report that did come out does say and recommends effectively we need a more comprehensive research effort because we don't know what these are. And, and and to your point, the government, at least publicly, is not ignoring it and saying it doesn't exist. They're actually saying they do exist now. Um, but we don't really have a good handle on it. So what is the sort of you know approach that needs to be taken? I, for one, and, not, and I'm not alone in this, I believe that whatever the approach is, it can't simply be the government. Because number one, they only have so much resources. And you know, there's also a lot of distrust that is particularly on this issue. So what I'm looking to see is not just is the Space Force put in charge of this, which is you know one of the things that's, that's under discussion. Another proposal under discussion is something like a Los Alamos National Laboratory, which is which is quasi-government. It's sort of government, but it brings in a lot of academics. And of course, they do all kinds of different technology, futuristic stuff. Um, that to me makes more sense. Um, some construct where you can bring in other people and not just have some siloed government agency saying, trust us, we're on it, we're figuring it out. And, and the good news is that members of Congress, I think that's where their head is too. They don't want to just give this to the government. Um, but you know, there's certainly going to be a big government component to it. So what does that look like? There's some things in the works. Um, the, Secretary, the Deputy Secretary of Defense, Kathleen Hicks, who I know pretty well. I knew her for many years before. She's very, I think she's a very honest and capable person. She has directed the military to give her suggestions. Um, how should this next ATIP look? In other words, what should the military's approach to gathering this information, distilling it, analyzing it look like? She's supposed to get some answers back, I think, sometime this fall. And so I'll be covering that, like sort of what is the next iteration of it? What what else? There's also some congressional language now in the, you know, it was the Senate Intelligence Committee under Marco Rubio that requested this government report in the first place. And um, they're apparently gonna have been proposing some additional public reports so okay, this was like the 1.0 version in June. What more can you tell us? Um, and I think it's interesting. I've talked to Rubio a little bit about this, but he said a lot of things publicly about it. I think it's important to remember that when he talks about this, almost in every instance, except for when he's sort of pressed on the aliens, he talks about it in national security terms. He doesn't talk about it in Oh, you know, we got to find out, you know, who's living on planet, you know, Krypton. It's, we have pilots saying this stuff is happening. They cannot defend against it. They don't know who it is. We got to move on with it. And I think it's actually politically smart because he's kind of minimizing the, the potential that he becomes some whack job who, you know, believes in aliens. You know, he wants to be president. And maybe he thinks there's a UFO vote too, which there might be. In this day and age, when people are open-minded and want answers, and, and like you're pointing out, like there's, they think there's evidence of stuff already, they might want leaders that, that are willing to talk about this stuff, willing to sort of go beyond. So I think he wants to benefit from the UFO piece of it politically, but he doesn't want to talk about it in those terms. Um, and again, I think it's, it's probably wise at this point. You mentioned that uh, the it's a fair question. Why would you trust an organization that supposedly most of us lied to us for 90 years, all of a sudden, you know, we don't say 
Yeah, I mean, it's a very fair point. And, I, and, and people have brought that up before. And I've, of course, been repeatedly accused of just being the sort of the, the cover-up artist. Um, uh, you know, the mainstream media is covering this now, and we're all just part of some new conspiracy or, or new effort to shield the truth. And, and um, this gets back to what I said before. Number one, I'm still waiting for my check or my bag of cash from the CIA because I haven't gotten it. And number two, um, not that they don't use the media. Of course they do. I mean, uh, and sometimes play it like a violin on a whole host of issues. But um, again, you'd have to accept that the coordination and the strategy was so sophisticated uh, for that to be true. And, and I just don't. I just don't think that's the case. Um, but a couple other points you made, which I think are important, is um, uh, you know the government didn't really deny the existence of UFOs throughout the Cold War. In fact, you could argue the opposite. Um, you could argue that they didn't tell you, you know, Project Blue Book was a whitewash and wasn't really meant to find answers and of course was just sort of a PR effort, which I think there's plenty of evidence even in the government archives that it was from the beginning an effort to just bury this issue because we don't want to deal with it. But I also think there's plenty of evidence that they used the UFO issue during the Cold War in the battle with the Russians. I mean, if you're building secret aircraft in the desert and you don't want the Soviets to know, it's actually not bad to have the Soviets also running around America looking at, you know, chasing UFO stories. And so I do think the government put out some stories about UFOs and certainly encouraged it because I think it was also part of clouding the intelligence picture in the battle with the Russians, which was a, I mean, most of us are old enough to remember that. That was a real struggle. And that was a daily struggle by the government to keep what we wanted to keep ours and know what they were up to. Um, and so the UFO issue was, I think it's pretty clear, was used in that in a very real way. And I don't necessarily blame them for that. Um, you want to cloud the picture and you don't want them to know about our new missiles or our new spy planes or any, anything else that we're working on. It's the perfect thing to just throw a bunch of marbles out there and have them chase them. Um, and then just one last point that you made I completely agree, agree with you. Um, the government isn't saying that they're aliens. They're saying we don't know what they are. And I do think that if we do learn more, what's that? Yeah, and they, and, and, um, and I think it's partially because they just don't want to go there. I mean, even if they have theories that they can't prove or they're not really sure, I, you know, I think at least some of them don't want to go there. Um, but I also think a lot of these sightings, and this is even true, I think, in the past, the vast majority of them are probably explainable. You mentioned drones. I think a lot of, a good significant amount of these things, if they ever are really explained and they get to the bottom of them, are gonna be drones. And maybe they're Chinese, maybe they're uh, some other you know, entity that's developed or stolen or re-engineered some of this drone technology. Maybe it's the French, maybe it's the Israelis, who knows? But, um, um, but it's certainly not all of them. But I think a lot of them really are truly just unidentified things in the air, but they're not necessarily you know, extraterrestrials. The front. You mentioned that, um, answering the gentleman back there, that a lot of times the government uses stories to maybe distract our enemies. Okay, so my question is, why now? Like, why is the Pentagon releasing this now? Is there an alternative agenda? Are they trying to distract either us Americans from other things that are going on, you know, that they're planning? Is it, you know, distract the enemies? Like, why now? Why, you know, since we've known this for decades and decades, why all of a sudden now, now oh, the Pentagon releases this information about UFOs, why now? The Pentagon has released nothing that they weren't forced to release by the politicians. Um, I think you have to understand who's squeezing who, who's twisting what arm. Um, if the Pentagon was left to its own brothers, the Pentagon would have said nothing about this. If Lou Elizondo didn't retire and decide that he wanted to go public, and you could say that he was a, you can argue he's a tool also for some bigger agenda, whether it's 
Tom DeLonge or Chris Mellon or some of these other players? I don't think so. Um, uh, I think, I mean, I've spent a lot of time on it. I think he genuinely thinks, what the hell are these things? And why do we not more rigorously try to find out? So um, I think if, if, if the assumption is that they're putting more stuff out, they're more willing to talk about it, I think it's a combination of a new generation of people that are in charge. You know, this is not Curtis LeMay anymore. These are generals that are my age. They're in their 40s, late 40s, early 50s. Um, and obviously some of them don't want to talk about it at all. A lot of them don't. They don't want to go there at all for religious reasons, for just normal everyday, I got to go by the book, and this, is, this ain't in the book. And, and that's another thing. I think the military resistance is that you don't know what it is. You don't know what box to put it in. Everything's got a box to file it away, to categorize it. It's got an acronym. It's got an office in charge of it. There's no office in charge of it. So I think a lot of it, again, gets sort of shunted to the side. I, but I think, again, to get back to your question, I think they're talking about it because they're being forced to talk about it. And it's some elected officials who you could argue have their own agenda too, and maybe they're in on the big conspiracy. But I mean, they can't get past a damn budget. Yeah. So the idea that there is this secret conspiracy that um, we're just going to shove this whole fake story or you know, the canard in front of the people so that they don't see what we're doing, um, I, I, I haven't yet come across enough evidence to suggest that. It doesn't mean they're not lying. It doesn't mean they're not hiding. It doesn't mean all of that stuff. But I think they are, there's a lot of reasons why they could be doing that. And, and they're short of some big, vast conspiracy. I mean, they, they hide things all the time. I guess to this point, um, I think you would probably agree there is quite a bit of evidence that they were not happy and still are not happy with Luis Elizondo coming forward. The Pentagon has not treated him well. No, I think you're right. And, you know, he's filed a complaint with the inspector general. I wrote about that because I figured that's a good story too. I mean, the guy who's the whistleblower, so to speak, claims that, um, you know, he's uh, being railroaded, that his professional standing is being threatened. And, you know, there are laws that, you know, that prevent the government from seeking retribution against you if, if you know, I, I don't think Lou is technically a whistleblower in the sense of the law, the Whistleblower Act, which I think is very specifically about somebody who reports wrongdoing within the government and then finds out that he got fired for it or you know they took some other action against him. He's basically saying, you're ignoring something important, which is very different than you're doing something wrong. Um, and so it'll be interesting to see legally, does the IG actually take that seriously? Do they pass it on to somebody else? He also hired this lawyer who, uh, Daniel Sheehan, who maybe some of you are familiar with, he's kind of a UFOologist, but he's also like, I think he was a lawyer in the, what was the? Oh, was he Oliver Russell? Mm -hmm. He was also- um, Pentagon Papers, I think, or was it? He was involved, he, rep he represented Daniel Ellsberg. Mm -hmm. He was part of the legal team at the law firm that represented Ellsberg. And then also um, the, the whistleblower, the nuclear power plant, Silkwood. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he's sort of been this government, anti-government sort of junkyard dog. And I think Lou hired him because he feels like if anybody's gonna get results, it'll be him. But, um, uh, and I think he's doing it for free. So, that probably helps. Did that office get shut down? ATIP? Yeah. It basically ran out of money. Um, it, you know, it didn't get another appropriation. And um, I remember I talked to the then, well, maybe, it was on background, so I, can, I can't say his name, but, he was a very senior person in, in the military, about as senior as he could get in the Defense Intelligence Agency. At the time, ATIP was created. And again, even ATIP was foisted on the Pentagon. Harry Reid, Daniel Inouye, Ted Stevens, you know, the appropriators in the Senate who wrapped the purse strings, they said, you're gonna do this. It's basically an earmark. So like, you know, normally the earmark is build a bridge in my district. This was an earmark, go study UFOs. And so the Pentagon didn't want it, the DIA didn't want it. Um, and this person told me that like, he sort of purposely was like, I don't even want to be briefed on it. Like, you know, go do it, because they want to do it. 
But he was sort of worried about like what it looks like. It looks like some senator wants us to do this. And oh, by the way, they're going to give all the contracts to his buddy Bob Bigelow in Nevada, which sounds like the bridge that goes to your, you know, your buddy who owns a construction company. So I think they thought it sort of smelled a little weird, even aside from the issue, which of course they didn't really want to touch. Um, but I think one of the biggest misnomers about ATIP, the office, and I take some blame for this, because I think in our early stories where we didn't really know yet the full makeup of it and the full story, we sort of had the, you know, the 1.0 first draft of what had gone on. It wasn't ever an office, it was a portfolio. If you know, having experience, like somebody was in charge of it, but it wasn't like you know you went to some down some long corridor and there was the A tip office and you went in and people were sitting around studying UFO reports. This was a portfolio. So Elizondo is a you know basically a counterintelligence officer who spent time interrogating captured terrorists. Um, had no real UFO background. He's kind of assigned this. Um, as one job of many. And I mean, clearly he got obsessed with it and it became sort of his main focus. But ATIP was, a, was never really a thing other than on paper with a few people sort of tasked with looking into this stuff. And, um, uh, and, and again, another example of depending on being forced to do something and to talk about it. Um, you know, the Pentagon didn't request a tip in their budget. They didn't say, hey, we want money for an office like they request everything else. Um, and, but I think now one of the, the results of this public report will also be a more permanent, I mean, it's now called a task force, the UAP task force. But that was always temporary. That was to answer the Congress's request for a report. But I think they're going to make something more permanent. And again, I think where that sits, you know, that's still to be figured out. Um, do you have an opinion on Tesla and then the company? I like where this is going, but Space no. <laughs> <laughs> um, my daughter's want me to buy a Tesla. <laughs> Um, so you never thought? Well, I mean, I've covered SpaceX because I cover the space race for Politico, um, or as I call it, astropolitics. And so obviously Musk is a, a big figure in that world, and which has nothing really to do with the Tesla piece of it. Um, Except that he, I think there's a, a, a correlation between the astropolitics and the What I like about Musk, and I've never met him, but I, I've certainly interacted a little bit with some people around him, um, particularly on the space business side, not really at all on the, on the cars. Um, you know, he's one of those people, one of those few people I think that comes across once a generation, who's a real disruptor. Um, and I think it's a good thing. I mean, you might not like him, you might think that he's sort of, you know, thinks he knows everything and he can solve every problem. He apparently just tweeted the other day that you know NASA's having problems with the spacesuits, so don't worry, we'll take care of it. We'll build them for you. Um, but he's very effective at PR and using social media to build his brand. But you know, he's a showman, but I think what makes him unique is he's he actually gets results. I mean he's completely changed the space launch business forever. I mean, his Falcon 9 that can go up and launch a satellite, or now they're doing um, missions to the space station on this Dragon capsule that he built, uh, that they built. Um, and then the rocket comes back. And so it's a hell of a lot cheaper. It makes space access so much more um, democratic in some ways. And Lockheed and Bowie, I mean, they're literally like distraught of it. Like, how did he do this? We can't do that. I mean, we had a lock on that market, and now we don't. I mean, SpaceX is now, you know, people don't, it's SpaceX don't like to talk about it, but they're an Uber defense contractor. Down here. I mean, the Air Force now launches the secret satellites on Musk's rockets, because it's a lot cheaper. Um, so, I mean, I, you know, Tesla 
Nikola Tesla? I mean, I, I don't know much about him. I've read about him. I mean, I always assumed that the connection, in, at least in Musk's mind, was he took that all that electricity crazy stuff that Tesla was talking about and doing, but I, and then made it real. Tesla was very connected to the, to the what? To things that happened oh. beyond, you know, I mean. Yeah, Musk is like that too. I think his brain is wired that way. I mean, he wants to go to Mars. I love his quote. Um, <laughs> I want to die on Mars, just not on impact. <laughs> so no, I mean, he's, he's definitely, he's the guy to watch. And he's so young, I mean, he's going to be around another 40 years. God knows what he's going to do next. <clears throat> kind of along those lines, you know, um, Harry Reid, of course, has been a very important figure in Washington, D.C. for decades, uh, a topic you and your colleagues cover. What was it like interviewing him this year but the topic being UFOs and other fringe kind of things, because he's in a lot into a lot more topics than just UFOs, right? Yeah, you know, I had covered him not really that up close when he was in the Senate, um, but a little bit. I mean, he was Senate Majority Leader, and obviously he was a big power broker in Washington on just about everything. I mean, I don't think it was very well known at all that he had this interest for all these years, and I think he wanted it that way. Um, I did a, I recommend it to you, if you want to hear or see more of my BS. Um, I did a magazine article for Politico Magazine a couple of months ago, ahead of this public report. It was sort of, I kept calling it the origin story because I felt like, okay, this government report is coming out. It would be useful to kind of go back and like recount how we got here. Like how did UFOs become such a big deal in Washington? You know, it's a public issue. And in doing that, with Alejandro's help, by the way, a lot of his help, um, in sort of unspooling the history, it was clear that Reed had been into this a long time and just didn't want it to be known because he was worried about the political cost. Um, and I think, you know, since he's, I mean, he's very public about it now, but he's also not in office anymore. He's retired. It, you know, he didn't talk about it when he created ATIP. We didn't know about it in 2007. We didn't know about it for another 10 years. So, um, uh, but you know, talking to him, and I have a bunch of times um, in the last few years. It is also interesting to me to hear about, this question came up about why now and, and sort of the more open mind among people about this issue. Um, he was telling me that the one person who really was into this issue was John Clegg. In a big way, but really just didn't want to be associated with it publicly, but but thought that a lot more needed to be done about it. Um, and you would like to think that John Glenn would have been read into some of the secret stuff going on, but maybe, maybe not. Or maybe there wasn't all that much secret stuff. Um, but you would think somebody like John Glenn would, would they could trust him with it, since he had been the first American in space and all over, to over the earth. Um, Ted Stevens was the other senator who was crucial in getting the money in the budget for ATIP. And you guys have probably seen this because it's been widely reported, but Ted, when Harry Reid went to Ted Stevens, he was a little bit nervous, he said, like head of the Appropriations Committee or the Defense Appropriations Subcommittee at the time. I need him to put this money in the defense budget. And he was like, I don't know what he's gonna say. And you know, first thing Ted Stevens says is, oh, Foo Fighters saw them all the time over Europe in World War II. Absolutely, how much you need. And so I think even back then, there was a sort of openness to it and an intrigue and a curiosity and, and maybe even real experiences, um, like in Ted Stevens' case, where it was just sort of like needed somebody to open the door. And, and that's what I hope happens, that like the Harry Reeds of the world, the Marco Rubio's have opened the door. And I think this is the kind of subject that once you open the door, it's like you don't know, you can't really stop it anymore. It may not happen in a year, it may not happen in two years, but I think if there is more to be known, um, it doesn't mean we're gonna know it all, we're gonna have all the secrets, but I, I think there's sort of a perfect storm happening where, I mean, as I pointed out in my article too, I mean, Harvard, MIT, Caltech, it's not like they never had anybody interested in this issue, but they never talked about it. Now they're creating, Harvard just created a whole new UFO something emerging technology like discipline, right? Um, so 
Time, uh, times are changing for sure. Anybody in that country? Have you spoken to any of the um, examples of native pilots that have these skills? A few of the native pilots, yeah. Um, and there, you know, that's one of the things that really got me focused on this story is these are very, not that average everyday people aren't credible, but they're, they're to me, especially credible because number one, we spent millions and millions and millions of taxpayer dollars to train them and effectively trust them with multi-million dollar airplanes. And so it doesn't mean that you don't have screw up pilots, of course you do, but by definition, they're in a world where there's been a lot of layers that have assumed and concluded they're trustworthy. And they're not completely out of their minds, popping no-dos all the time and seeing things. And, um, and it wasn't just the pilots. It was also the, the common picture, as the Navy would call it. I think what's also different about these reports now than before is a pilot and maybe even um, a radar operator or a co-pilot would come back and make a report, if they made the report at all. In most cases, they didn't at all because they didn't want to be, you know, passed over for promotion because they're thought to be coupons. Um, but that was really just a standalone report. We saw something and we can't explain what it was. The Nimitz case, the Roosevelt case, these aircraft carriers that became prominent in this whole discussion, these are pilots, multiple pilots in multiple aircraft, other ships in the battle group picking it up on a radar. We also have technology now where they're fusing this into a common computer picture. And they're getting inputs from multiple sensors. So it's not just one pilot came back and said, I saw this. And I think that's also changed their approach to it. I think they take it more seriously now than maybe they did before, because they can't just say it's one pilot or two pilots who saw it. And maybe they thought they saw it, but they didn't really see it. Now it's like, oh, the radar saw it, the airborne control plane saw it, the pilot saw it. The guy on the bridge saw it. I mean, it's like, you can't ignore it anymore. And so um, I'm glad you brought that up because I think that's a big reason why it's changing too. And I'm still waiting for the clear picture though. Like where's the clear shot of the thing? They all seem to be grainy, right? They all seem to be, but I have a theory about that, if you want to know, it's just a theory. My theory is that if these are an advanced force, terrestrial or otherwise, we have the technology to jam electric signals, to jam enemy radars. We can build a plane that evades radar. So if they're so advanced, maybe they have an ability to make it really hard for them to be captured. They don't want to be seen. They're not ready to be seen. They're not, you know, they're in secret stealth mode. And so even your iPhone, and that's the argument people always make. It's like, there's a billion iPhones in the world. Why do we not have thousands and thousands of pictures of these, of these things. I'm just saying it's a theory of mine, but I feel like if you're gonna assume they're so advanced, maybe they could fuzz them out or they make it so we can't really capture them that easily. We have time for one more. What's your theory of where do they come from? Like I said, I think some of them come from here. Um, I think there's no doubt in my mind that some of these reports, even in that 139, very small set that the government apparently looked at in this government report. I'm sure most of them from here. Um, you know, who's operating them, who developed them, you know, who knows? I mean, if you believe there's secret, secret, secret compartments to the government that even the most secret heads of the government don't know about, then it's, you know, it's possible the government said they're not ours, and they are ours. They're just ours in a place that the people at the top don't know is going on. Um, but when I do get this question, what do I think? If, if, if they're not from here, I keep going back to one of the studies that ATIP commissioned, which I also, which I always found fascinating. I've never seen the full study because it was classified, but they did release the list of 38, I think it was 38 studies that ATIP had, had commissioned through Bigelow Aerospace. And they got scientists from all over the country, you know, professors and stuff to, to do these theoretical studies. So they were theoretical. They were not, you know, they, 
they were not based on like, here's a piece of material, go study it and see if it's a UFO. It was more like, here's the pilot reports, here's the sort of the testimony of what people have said they've seen. Explain how you think something could operate that. So if it's going from 80,000 feet to the surface of the ocean in three seconds, how, how could that be? Like sort of aerodynamically, explain it. And one of the studies was titled, I forget exactly the title, but it was something like multidimensional travel. And it was theorizing that they're not from billions of light years away. Maybe they're from here, but it's just a different year. And they come into our field of view, and it looks like they disappeared, but they just went back to here. It's just, it's a different here. And I think if you, you know, were addicted to stranger things like I was, um, it's not inconceivable. In fact, in some ways, it's more rational than going a billion light years, because even a billion light years takes a billion years at the speed of light. So unless you're going through a wormhole or a cut in a space-time continuum, as Doc Brown would say, it's a really far distance to have to go. And why would you send a biological being at all? You just send a drone. If you're that advanced, why would you send a physiological being that kind of distance? It just makes no sense. Um, and you know, you guys have heard all this before because I've been reading it in books that Alejandro has recommended. But all, you know, there's these theories, and if it is something that's other, I tend my brain just tends to go to let's stop thinking about the stars and think about something more, more here. Just you know, we know there are things we can't see that exist, right? I mean, our cell phones talk to each other, and so I don't know. Maybe maybe that's Maybe. Politico, I said maybe. <laughs> I didn't say that's what it is. Um, anyway, I think we're out of time. Let's give a big round of applause. Thanks all for coming. And if you enjoyed that, um, Brian is also going to be interviewing Five Stivington, that I don't know if you know, he's the former governor of Arizona, who actually saw the Phoenix Lights. And he'll be interviewing him at our upcoming live streaming conference. Um, it's in two weeks. And um, you can get more information at www.ufocongress.com. And it was on that flyer as well. Um, but yeah, lots of people are going to be in uh, speakers. We're going to have Lou Elizondo. We're going to have um, Abby Loeb of Harvard. Um, we're going to have Alejandro is going to be our MC once again. Um, but uh, yeah, you can go to our website and look at all the speakers and the uh, schedule, and uh, and we hope you can join us. So thanks a lot for coming.